thanks for coming out and uh, we hope you enjoy going out and doing your collecting. All right, have fun. Hi, my name is Erin and I'm a third year ecosystem management technology student at Fleming College. And this is wildlife, sort of. There are 101 wildlife species at risk in Ontario, 40 of which are endangered, extirpated, or extinct. An at-risk designation is given by either the Ministry of Natural Resources at the provincial level, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada at the national level, or both. As you can see in this map, the highest concentration of endangered species occurs in Ontario, specifically southern and central Ontario. Being an at-risk species applies to any plant or animal threatened by or vulnerable to extinction. At-risk species are divided into five categories, depending on how at-risk they are. The extinct group applies to species that are no longer found anywhere. For example, passenger pigeon, which became extinct in 1914. Extirpated applies to those species that no longer exist in the wild in Ontario, but that do exist elsewhere. For example, the paddlefish, which was last seen in Ontario in 1919 in Lake Huron and Lake Erie. Endangered species are those facing imminent extinction or extirpation in Ontario. For example, the loggerhead shrike, which only has 18 known breeding pairs in Ontario as of 10 years ago. Threatened species are those that are at risk of becoming endangered in Ontario if limiting factors are not reversed. For example, the eastern Mississauga rattlesnake with fewer than 350 isolated individuals throughout what, southwestern Ontario. Species of special concern are species with characteristics that make it sensitive to human activities or natural events. For example, the polar bear is fast becoming further at risk due to the loss of ice and pollution. Invasive species are those that are non-native to a certain area being introduced into the ecosystem. Invasive species are not always detrimental to an ecosystem depending on the individual species' characteristics. For example, the house mouse was originally from the Indian subcontinent and was brought here through sea travel in the mid-1800s. Widespread through North America now, although it does not cause any substantial detriment to na native wildlife, it is still considered an invasive species because it is not native and has flourished. Carrying capacity is the largest number of individuals of a particular species that can be maintained indefinitely in a given ecosystem. Generally, if the carrying capacity is exceeded for a population, individuals will migrate or die off until a balance is reached again. There are several key factors that influence carrying capacity. These include starvation, sometimes due to an exceeded carrying capacity, disease or parasites, harsh weather, and predators. If any of these factors are in excess or shortage, the carrying capacity will either be exceeded or will drop too low, and there will be too few individuals to carry on the population. A classic example of carrying capacity is the snowshoe hare and lynx populations. The snowshoe hare is the preferred prey of the Canadian lynx. Both these populations follow a predictably cyclical population flow as a result. Snowshoe hares have a high reproductive rate and a corresponding low population. However, being the preferred food for the lynx, lynx will hunt the hares to the point where the death rate exceeds the reproductive rate. Since there is now less food for the lynx, their population begins to decrease because of starvation. As the lynx die off, the hares have a chance to increase their population due to a lack of predators and the cycle begins again. When the ground in an area becomes stripped of its vegetation from fire, flood, glaciation or volcanic activity, it will become rapidly recolonized by a series of vegetation. Most successions are secondary, which is the recovery of a disturbed site. Primary succession occurs on sterile ground, such as caused by a glacier or after being covered by volcanic activity. Wildlife can follow the succession of a forest as, depending on the species, some are more suited to earlier succession and others when the forest becomes more mature. For example, the ecosystem in earlier succession is more suited to the red fox or woodchuck, while later succession is more suited to black bears, white-tailed deer, or red squirrels. A food chain is the transfer of food energy from plants to herbivores to carnivores. For example, in this chain, 
The grasshopper feeds the frog, which feeds the snake, which in turn feeds the hawk. A food web is the interconnectedness of food chains. This shows the original food chain and how it is further connected to other food chains. For example, the hawk also eats chipmunks, which eat seeds from the tree, and the tree feeds the deer, and so on. Habitat destruction. No good. Habitat destruction is very problematic in Ontario, especially in the southern region. As we can see, wildlife will become isolated so that the population may eventually become genetically stagnant. Wildlife corridors help to solve this problem, offering a path for wildlife from patch to patch. A good example of this is in Alberta, where along the highway through Banff, wildlife bridges allow wildlife to cross through busy highways freely and stopping the problem of fragmentation. So when you're IDing birds, like this one, you look for the beak, the feathers, the legs and beak, and sometimes the tail.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>